Hi, my name is Greg Sullivan. I'm the director of the Positive Coaching and Athletic Leadership Master's Program at the University of Missouri. We are starting a series of brief interviews with coaches in the athletic world that we believe have shared values with our program and to give them that, the, the opportunity to highlight their work and their ideas. We're, we're calling the series Mizzou Positive Columns, uh, six questions. Why six questions? Well, six questions were chosen. They, they represent the number of iconic columns you see over my shoulder, which are located in Francis Quadrangle at the University of Missouri. For the university, these columns represent uh, resilience, grit, and other positive values of this university and this program. Today, I'm pleased to be able to speak with three young coaches, and in the interest of full disclosure, they are my sons. Uh, my son, Chris, it was just in April, was named the head men's basketball coach at Denison University. He's been at Denison for 10 years. Uh, yeah, nine going on 10. Nine going on 10, and was, the, uh, was an assistant coach, and then was the associate head men's coach, and then was named head coach in April. My uh, middle son, Kevin, is uh, the uh, assistant men's basketball coach at um, Emory University in, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Kevin, uh, after graduating from DePaul University in Indiana, uh, was, was the graduate assistant at Defiance College. And then for three years, Kev, at the, the assistant coach at Kenyon. Three at Kenyon. And then the, fin just finished your third year at Emory University. Correct. And Brian Sullivan is the Director of Student Athlete Development at the, his alma mater, Davidson College, and uh, has been there. This is, we just finished your second year. Correct. And prior to that, had the opportunity to play professionally in, uh, in Germany, the Czech Republic, and Australia. Um, all three of these guys uh, have um, pl played for Upper Arlington High School, played for a really kind of a wonderful coaching staff at the high school level played for Tim Casey and Greg Alaco. So what, what I wanted to do is just, um, if you could just give me just uh, your impression of having played for the same coaching staff, what, uh, what, what did you think of that, Chris? What you, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, those two coaches, Tim and Greg, I think I take a lot with me. Um, and uh, yeah, just learned a ton about basketball growing up, especially through Tim on the X's and O's side and the um, player development, team development, and really executing things that way. And then uh, just how I treat and, and build relationships with my players I take from Greg. Uh, so the two played off of each other really, really well in that regard and uh, loved, loved both parts of that coaching staff and that relationship. Kev? Yeah, I think Chris brings up a good point that they did balance each other or they did play off each other really well. Um, I definitely find myself using a lot of things that they taught. Um, I think the biggest takeaway from me or for me from both of them was just kind of competitiveness and being competitive, using it, but then also like managing it and really like learning to play the game, um, letting the game kind of flow through me when I need to, or like the controlling things when I needed to. And I think that's probably my, my biggest takeaway from those two, uh, those two coaches. Brian, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I would agree with Kevin um, about probably the biggest thing being the competitiveness. Um, and in your high school years, just there's really no way around working hard with them. Um, that was the only way we did things. And I think that was really um, important during that period. Um, I also think it was like my first exposure um, at a program. Um, it wasn't a team, it was a program. Um, and th just like the messaging around, um, Chris's teams were always brought up, Kevin's teams were brought up. Um, and it was something um, I didn't realize at the time, but, but going on and playing something that was really important to, to why I enjoyed being around basketball. Yeah, as you guys have told me that, you know, as you travel around the country and, 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 you know, scout players and look at players and watch high school programs that you, you just, um, you have the opportunity to kind of look back and say, wow, this, this was really done at a really elevated level. You know, Tim, Tim was the, you know, the uber prepared for a high school game, X's and O's. And then Greg, I think was, was really kind of the, you know, the, 
the personnel side, the, the player, you know, um, you know, relationship driven side. And so you really got a great balance, I think is, 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 was really interesting to, to watch. All right. So we're going to start with our, um, with our six questions and uh, Kev, we'll start with you. I, and also in full disclosure, um, Kevin is a student in, in our program at the University of Missouri, finishing his master's degree. So Kev, uh, as, as a student in the midst of the program, what does is, what is positive coaching mean to you? Yeah, positive coaching is, is something that, that incorporates, like, and, and I put down some notes, but um, for me, like, it incorporates a better understanding and use of communication between coaches and players. Um, it's creating a an environment and a mindset of growth, um, the ability to accept challenges as opportunities to learn and improve. Um, and then it also has a lot to do with creating those positive relationships within that, um, within that environment, within that team to, to be able to work together to achieve common goals. Um, and I kind of, I want to just leave it at that. That's what positive coaching is to me. Yeah. I, a lot of our students um, are, are, you know, they're introduced to different theories and the, and the one they really, one of, that they really seem to, to latch on to and, 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 and really informs their coaching is, is one, one that you brought up the growth mindset that, that they really never, you know, they, they find, find themselves actually being guilty at times of a fixed mindset and it's really kind of liberating for them to realize that there is this different approach. So, Brian, what's, uh, what are your thoughts about positive coaching? Um, again, I haven't had the, uh, the fortune of taking any classes, um, but I would think of positive coaching um, as coaching the person first. Um, I think what Kevin said was building positive relationships, but um, yeah, coaching the player or the person first and then the player. Um, and I think that that leads to um, – more of a relationship um, in that way. Um, yeah. So you want to be seen as Brian Sullivan first before you're seen as, as basketball player Brian Sullivan. Correct. Yeah. How does that make, how does that make a difference to you? Um, I think it builds a level of trust. Um, I think um, when you do have that level of trust, I think you can be more demanding. Um, and I think, I think probably you would know best, but I think one of the big misconceptions around positive coaching is that um, there's not accountability or, or any type of demanding coaching. Um, and I think that's probably far from the truth. So I think when you build a relationship and they know that you care about them and build trust with them, that kind of allows you to have that demanding side um, while still in an environment where mistakes are okay and, and um, um, confidence is built. Yeah, I, I would agree. That's a, a, a misunderstanding that uh, that it's it's a that there is not accountability. There's not um, uh, there there is no there is no demanding. There is no discipline. You know, those those nothing could be further from the truth. Players players want, need, and deserve those things. So I think uh, that's that's a great point. Chris, how about you? What uh, what is what does positive coaching mean to you? Uh, Brian started to touch on it. The, the two words that come to my mind is the, the constant play of, of demanding and supportive. And I think creating expectations in an environment that is incredibly demanding, it pushes your players beyond a point where they could just push themselves if they didn't have the coaches and the coaching staff. Um, but also an environment that has the coaches and the players working together. I think a lot of practice environments are the players working until the coach is happy because it's his expectations. But I think uh, a positive coaching atmosphere is one where the coaches and the players have the same goals, the same aspirations and the same expectations, but they get there together. And it's a coach's job to develop the relationships like Kevin's talking about and seeing them as people and all working together towards a common goal of, you know, excellence or whatever that program deems to be their goal, but uh, doing it together as opposed to, you know, some sort of conflict that which which often arises if if the coach is the expectation. Would you say that the um, the support has to come before the demand? 
Yeah, I think so. I think you, they've got to understand that you care about them and you want the best for them before you can, uh, you know, really push, uh, you know, past a certain point. <laughs> All right, Brian, we're going to start with you on this one. When, when do you enjoy your role the most? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think as I thought about it, probably, um, working with players after setbacks, um, whether it's like post game film or shooting with a player after a bad shooting night. Um, I really enjoy that. I like to reframe, um, I think what most college athletes, how most college athletes view setback, um, which is like just failure. They feel like a failure. Um, and I think when I was playing, that was probably one of the things I struggled most with was just not having that perspective that a season looks like this. Um, and so if I can help kind of be an outside view of, of what a setback looks like and how you have to attack it, um, I really enjoy doing that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of incredible when, you know, you can, you can even share, you know, the simple math of it, right? <laughs> if I average 15 points a game, rarely will I score 15 points a game. Yeah. Someday I'll be 20 and the next I'll be, tw- uh, you know, I'll be 10, you know, and, and so that there, there is that. Um, and, and I think that in coaching, um, sometimes we, we forget that, you know, that, that, that you got players have really high expectations and if they don't meet that expectation, they really see themselves as failing. You, you, you see a lot of that. Totally. Yeah. 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 A lot of, uh, or, or like, for example, it, I always think of basketball and shooting, but if, if they have a bad shooting night, it now means they're a bad shooter. Um, and so just kind of working through that and, and reshaping how they view obstacles. Um, it's kind of the price of admission for, for playing. So you enjoy seeing that kind of light bulb go off when they start to understand that. Totally. Yeah. Chris, how about you? When do you enjoy your role the most? I think uh, I enjoy it most when I can see myself uh, and my necessity to, to kind of be phased out in a way that, you know, uh, transition or progression from a freshman or sophomore who's still really learning a lot and you're helping them through that learning phase. But then as they transition into leaders and you can see that same freshman or sophomore is now a junior or senior and he is teaching the other ones what he learned a couple of years ago that you helped him with. And kind of, you know, just that whole progression of seeing the light bulbs go off, seeing it sink in, seeing that um, take place during a, you know, high heated game setting. And then a couple weeks later, a year or two later in practice, they are telling the younger freshman or sophomore who's going to come after them, hey, here's, here's what I know and I want to give that information to you. Um, And so, you know, that that was just a seed that you planted a couple years ago. And now that's, that's grown so much and is planting other seeds all over the place. And, and that's really about seeing your, your culture in action, right? That, that, that uh, you're actually, you know, that, that's, you know, you want the leadership to come from within, not, not always from, from the coaching staff. Right. I think that's, that's how, you know, you've done a good job teaching is when they can go and teach somebody else. Um, and then you watch them, you know, teach the other person and they learn and it just constantly progresses. And yeah, that's, that's culture in and of itself right there. Cool. Ken, when, when do you enjoy your role the most? It's a, on a very, very similar note. I, I do enjoy the kind of problem identification process of understanding what scheme as a team we can use to, to beat somebody. But I also enjoy just like identifying the problems that, that individuals maybe are facing. So I like that part of it, but the better side for me is then the problem solution side and the implement, imp, implementation of teaching that. So working with an individual in, a, in an individual workout and through that problem identification, like giving him and teaching him the tools so that he can overcome it himself. And then it's really like those moments that are happening in a game where they're putting those tools to use and they're overcoming challenges that they used to face um, in the past. So just that teaching process, the understanding and then implementation by the player from what I was able to identify and then help solve. So it's, it's, um, it's really engaging them in the process of, of, of improvement, right? Yes. Oh, cool. 
Uh, let's see. Um, Chris, what, what provided your most influential learning experience? That's, that's a good one. Um, the, the year that we had the most success in my nine years of coaching was probably the year that I enjoyed the least. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, we, we, were, we went 22 and five. We were top 25 in the country, got inside of top 10. And um, at the end of the year, we were held out of the NCAA tournament because of a math equation based on strength of schedule. And, you know, the whole time we knew we were going to be pretty good that year. Um, and so we, we just created a lot of expectations and a lot of our happiness was based on results. And one, once you get there, you realize you're not a different coach. You're not a different person. And, uh, and I think looking back, I didn't enjoy that year nearly as much as I could have or should have um, because we were just so focused on winning the next game. And um, I think it taught me that, yeah, you know, it's it's way more about relationships and the day to day, you know, competitive environment that you that you set and that you enjoy, and that that good coaches are are good coaches regardless of the record. I think a lot of that is so based on players, um, and, uh, and and those come and go, and so I think I, I'm I'm no better or worse of a coach when we went 22 and five a couple of years ago when we went, you know, 13 games, two years prior to that and 11 last year, same process, same system. Um, but I, I enjoy coaching way, way more now than I did that, that one year. So as a young coach, you learned that um, you, you can't get so enamored of the, of the wins that you lose focus of the process. Right. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. Kevin, what was uh, what was your most influential learning experience? Yeah, for, at first look at this question, I I kind of immediately jumped to our, like, where did I kind of learn the most? And so, like, I initially thought back to that first year at Defiance where I really jumped two feet into coaching, and that was my first experience taking everything in. But through my career, through my process, like, that first year that I was at Emory um, was the most influential kind of experience for me as a coach because I had learned a lot about coaching and I had learned certain ways to do things but for the first time my first year at Emory I really realized like what it took to be successful and that there are some ways that that you can do things kind of and for me it was like the right way to do things that that allowed you to be successful um, as a coach. So it was the experience of, of being at my first year at Emory was the most influential for me. So what, what was the key difference? Was it attention to details or? It was, it was a lot of different things. It was attention to detail. Um, it was kind of just like a mindset of, of being confident and, and trusting that that if you just do things kind of the right way and you pay attention to the details, a lot of the outcome stuff will, will take care of itself because of how you approach things. Um, but it was also just organization and like having, having a mission and working towards something versus like a, just avoiding things. And, um, and all of those things combined really, help elevate a program and help elevate a team and bring people closer together. So it, it's, it's really, you've seen three different programs, well, four different programs and, and some are more program like than others, right? Absolutely. And yeah, this, like for this, my experience is in relation to college coaching. I think we already talked about how learning from Tim and Greg was extremely beneficial at the high school level. And you can steal a lot of those things, but this, for the first time, like being at Emory was how a NCAA Division three college level basketball team could really be successful and, um, and achieve a lot of things. And, and there's, you know, there's no denying that, that that program has been kind of a national leader for a long time. Yes. And, and Coach Zimmerman has really established a, a culture, a program. Absolutely. Yeah. Brian, what's, what's uh, provided your most influential learning experience? Yeah, for me, um, and, and having not been in coaching for terribly long, um, 
is actually going back to as a player. Um, and that would be uh, actually playing while being married. Um, I played a lot of basketball before I was married and um, always struggled with just the pressure to perform. Um, and then I got married to my wife. We moved abroad and, and played two seasons. And it was during that process that, um, and part of it was because she, she doesn't know anything about basketball. Um, oh, and I'm not so sure about that. She, uh, you know, was, she didn't care how I played. She didn't care if I shot it well. Um, she cared if I put the dishes away. Um, and there was something really unique about that. Um, and I think for the first time, I kind of saw myself more as a person than a player um, through that, that process. Um, and it allowed me to flourish, I think. I think I was a lot more fearless and, and the game was just able to be the game that it was supposed to be. Um, so I think, and, and I should, should say that most of my coaching, almost all of my coaching in my position is on an individual basis. Um, so I think that that really informed what I do now the most. So you, you provide for them the benefit of your perspective. So you so in a lot of ways, your identity changed, right? Your identity changed from player only to now husband. And, and that, you know, you have to, you're concerned about this other person. And so other things, become a little bit less important right yeah that missed shot doesn't isn't a dagger to the heart now um or a bad game you can you can go to sleep at night um and i think i think just understanding that um especially maybe i'm fortunate but the the guys that i coach have a tendency to care too much um i don't have to really worry about them not caring enough um about the team and their performance. Um, so I think that really shapes how, how I try to work with them. So in, in some ways, do you try to get them to care a little less or just just get a sense of balance? Or? I, I, think, I think a lot of times they have tunnel vision. Um, and I think to, the more they can see that it's a, a big, beautiful world around them, um, that there's other things. Um, I think it just allows them to play instinctively um, versus having like a death grip on, on their performance. Wow. Uh, who, who are we up to? Brian? Are we up to Brian? Sure. Ready? I'm ready. Did, did you did you answer that question, Chris? I think I went first on that one. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there's so a lot Kevin, one there. So Kevin goes next. Okay. Um, Kevin, can you suggest a, a book or two that young coaches should um, should read? Um, yeah, outside of the textbook that I just read for my first class, which had a ton of great information. I think like the first two books that immediately come to mind are uh, Legacy and The Inner Game of Tennis. Ah, okay. Yeah, I think those are really easy ones to suggest. I think that's probably at the top of everybody's list, but they're at the top of everybody's list for a reason. Well, it's interesting because you, you talked about uh, you talked about a program versus a team, and and legacy is really about about culture, about uh, the importance of, um, of 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 everybody being on the same page and and perpetuating that culture. It's a, it's a great book. I think uh, uh, John Kerr, I think, is is the author. And the inner game of tennis. What's that? What's why why should a basketball coach, um, for example, read inner game of tennis? Well, okay, yeah, it's a, it's bigger than than just tennis. It's it's mindset. It's, I mean, there's a lot of things involved in that, but it's, there's so many different takeaways that, that are applicable throughout all sport that, that people and that coaches can use. Well, it's, it's what Brian talked about just a second ago. It's about acting instinctively, right? Instead of thinking all the time, yeah. you know, that's, he, he also wrote the inner game of golf and, you know, and, and, and if you think about, you know, golf, trying to think about five different things as you're, as you're trying to hit a golf ball. It's, it's a recipe for disaster. And so um, I, I think I read somewhere that uh, Steve Kerr, the coach of the Warriors, he went, if he, people visit him you know, and they say, what should I read? The first book he'll hand to them is, is the inner game of golf. And because, you know, and he points to, 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 to Steph Curry and to um, uh, um, uh, my, uh, Clay, uh, Thompson, what's his first, I'm sorry. The, yeah, Thompson. Clay Thompson. Clay Thompson, sorry. That those those are he said those are the two most instinctive players he's ever ever been around. They're not thinking at all about their jump shot when they're shooting their jump shot. It's just uh, so those are those are great recommendations. 
Brian, how about you? What, uh, what books would you recommend? Uh, I kid you not. I had the same two written down. No uh, way. Yeah, I swear. I think, and again, like Steve Kerr reads it. I think Pete Carroll reads it before every season. Yep. Um, I think one kind of addresses more how you coach individuals and the other, I think is kind of how you build a team culture. So I think those were, um, two, two great answers, Kev. Um, I guess if I were to give one of my own, um, or one new one, I would probably say growth mindset. Um, it's pro- probably a popular answer, but I think it does. Um, I, I think it shows you how, um, the importance of a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Um, and when you're playing any sport, there's going to be setbacks and failures or what, what are seen as failures. And, um, so if you're, if you're in sport, you're going to experience that. And I think how to, how to grow from that and bounce back from that, I think is really important. And it's not only growth mindset for your players, it's, it's growth oh, mindset for, t- for coaches, right? Totally. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, are you going to say the inner game of tennis and, and, uh... I'm not, I'm not, I'm actually, there, there's a book I'm reading for the second time through. I think the first time it, it's called the, the power of mindful learning. Oh, okay. Um, re- really interesting. The, the, again, the first time through, I, I was just so awoken to, to understanding like that. I didn't know what I didn't know in a lot of this stuff, but I think it, it challenges just a lot of your preconceived notions or cognitive biases on, on how to learn things. Um, and just how in a lot of ways our current educational learning based system is, is pretty archaic and, and not very mindful in how it's structured and organized. Um, so yeah, just it's something too that I think can be taken right into the practice environment or the classroom setting with, with your athletes. Who's the author, Chris? It's uh, Ellen J. Langer. Okay. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been an interesting read. I'm, I'm reading it through again to now see how I can apply it. Um, but uh, yeah, pretty pretty interesting stuff. You know, it was uh, one of the things that we all watched the uh, the Last Dance, mm-hmm. and the one thing that, I, that I, there was a few things that really struck me. But one thing that when I was really struck when I, I can't remember who said it, what was it? Uh, the guy who wrote the book Rare Air, and he said that Michael Jordan was the most present person mm-hmm. he's ever been around. He, he said he, he is the, the embodiment of presence and, 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 you know, and how that informed him as an athlete. So that's, that's a, a really interesting insight from somebody who spent a lot of time around him. What, do you have another book, Chris? Or? Uh, actually, the other thing I was going to mention was not a book, but a podcast. Um, the Finding Mastery podcast with Michael, oh, Michael Gervais. Gervais. And I, I, what I get out of that one, I think, is – he asks so many good questions about how people think and why people think and, and to a lot of Brian's points, who, who they are um, as coaches, as CEOs, as leaders. And I, I get just as much from the non-athletes related um, in their profession than I do, you know, the coaches and players. And, and I think what, what those questions also do is make you reflect on how you would answer those questions if you were on the podcast. And as a young coach in their twenties and thirties, trying to come up with, you know, what, what phrase or saying cuts to the core of who you are? That's one of his go-to questions. Like, that's, that's pretty eye-opening and tough. And I don't know how many, you know, young 20-year-olds have thought about, you know, that intentionally and that deeply about who they are. Um, and yeah, maybe, and I, what I, informs your actions, right? What informs you as a coach? Right. So I, the, he usually puts one of those out every week. And that's as soon as it comes out, I listen to it. And, uh, and I, I get, usually in my head, keep replaying that and ask myself those same exact questions. Well, I've checked all your answers and they're all wrong. The book is Servant Leadership in Sport, Theory and Practice by Gregory Sullivan. That's the book. So I'm sorry, all your answers are incorrect. So thanks for playing our game. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right, Brian, what's the best idea you ever stole from, uh, from another coach, another player? Um, that was a tough one. Um, I think I probably had two. Um, I think one is my current boss uh, and the coach I played for, Coach McKillop. Um, and one thing he always says is, is the kids want to do well. Um, and to coach from that as a fact that they're there, they're giving you their effort and that they want to do it well. Um, I think the other idea um, was from a coach I had in Australia. 
and um, he was really good at, at having player led teams um, and how he viewed himself as a coach. He, he used to say, I'm just the bus driver. You guys are telling me where you want to go. Um, and from the start, we had a lot of meetings and, and everything. Um, how we came to like that sense of team identity, what we wanted to do was he asked the players what we wanted to do, how we wanted to play, what are, what we wanted our identity to be. And we all had to write it down. Um, and so it gave us that voice and that buy-in. Um, and obviously I don't really have that now as a coach, I'm not leading team, team meetings. Um, but I think that's an idea that I stole and I, and I love. And, and it's, it's really, it's a, it's a simple premise. I, I, I heard an interview with uh, John Harbaugh. So John Harbaugh is an, an anomaly that he's been an NFL head coach for a long, long time in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a league where the shelf life is only a couple of years. And he makes it a point to constantly ask his players, what do you think? What do you think of practice? What, can, what, should, we, what should we work on? And, and how empowering that is for an athlete to hear that from a coach that not only do they have a voice, but they're, they're actually being listened to. And, and that's really, it really a huge difference maker, isn't it? Yeah. We would have practices where he would, he would give uh, the captains a ball and just say, have at it. And uh, he would sit and watch. Um, and, and again, you have the benefit of having a lot of older guys, guys in their thirties, but um yeah, it was, it was, it was neat to be a part of something I hadn't, I hadn't seen before. And even younger coaches, uh, well, coaches, not younger coaches, but coaches coach at younger teams. You know, if they just set aside 10 minutes of their practice to say, this is your time, what, what should we work on? You know, because then they'll, they'll give you an idea of what they really don't understand of where they, of what they, where they think they need to, to, to improve upon. Um, and, and, you know, and again, that, that level of, uh, of autonomy is, is just, uh, is really powerful. So, Chris, what's, what's the best idea you ever stole from, uh, from another coach? You know, I don't know if it's the best long-term idea, but the one that's on my mind, um, presently when you sent some questions was, uh, yesterday I was on a zoom call and I, you know, I heard the idea and we're implementing it ASAP. And, um, Kevin Hopkins is the head coach at Muhlenberg basketball. And something he does every day with his players is he calls them battery checks. And so he, he, has, he sends them a Google form. And on their way down, walking over to the gym, or as soon as they walk in the locker room, they have to take, you know, just two or three minutes and answer a couple simple questions. You know, how, much, how, how many hours of sleep did you get last night? And what was the quality of it? Are you hydrated? Uh, what's your stress level? Um, how excited are you about practice? And then the last one was just, you know, on a, zero to 20, 20 to 40, like wh where's your battery at uh, going into this practice? And I, I just thought it was a really unique way to, um, to have players think about themselves and evaluate how their day's going. And then also have them realize how much, uh, how in control of that they are. I think a lot of people just, oh, I'm having a bad day because I'm having a bad day. Well, like, you know, you're in control of all of these factors that make up that day. Wow. Um, and the, the last thing he uses with that battery is, you know, if, if you're at 60%, try to empty the tank. If you're at 80%, try to empty the tank. Every, everybody's going to be at a different level each day. But as you head into practice, whatever you have, give it to us. Um, and, uh, yeah, I thought that was a really, really good idea for, for players to reflect and for coaches to get that information so they can then approach somebody, hey, you've been at a 40% the last three days. What, you know, how, how can we check in with that player? Um, and just, you know, make them just get their battery level up. How about for coaches themselves, you, you and your assistant coaches to kind of, you know, raise your level of self-awareness. Yep. Yep. I think it'd be just as, just as valuable, if not more to how, 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 how many days a week am I going in at 80% or better so that I'm giving my players my best self. I've also read that, um, similar approach to just to marriage, like, you know, you know, checking in with your spouse as to where, where are you so that you can avoid, you know, instead of trying to guess where they are and you can avoid so many things that if you, if you really, if, if you're, if you're self-aware and honest and say, you know, right now I'm, I'm at 40%, not a good time to have a discussion about money or, uh, right. you know, or think, you know, think. Is that, is that Brene Brown's idea? What's that? Brene Brown. I think, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, so. I yeah. I think, uh, Chris, going back to, you're, you're at this corner for me. Um, 
I have done the checking in, um, kind of the battery checks. We did it on like a biweekly basis when I was playing. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the other things we had on there that I thought was interesting was, again, kind of like how excited are you for practice, but it said, what's your motivation and where's your confidence? Mm-hmm. And I thought that was a cool way for coaches to kind of keep tabs on. Um, I think what, where players to recognize where they were and then coaches to kind of have a, a – something on their radar that they could check in on a player or something. Yeah. Look, look the, one thing that he said he's going to add to it this year is just, um, I don't know how it'll be measured, but like, do you, as a player, you know, one of the questions, do you feel like you need to talk to the coaches or do you, do you know where you're at? Do you need to have a conversation? Um, just to open up that, that opportunity for players to feel like they can approach the coaches um, and then the coaches can get that feedback without them you know, formally scheduling an individual meeting and just say, hey, no, I'm good, or hey, I'm questioning my role, and I'd like to just, you know, have a quick conversation about that. Uh, what, what, a, what a great way to inform your daily coaching, though, you know, mm-hmm. walking into practice and having a sense of where, where your players are. That's, that's a great idea. Yeah. Jeff, what's, what's the best idea you ever stole from somebody else? Yeah, the, the best idea, and I think, is, is applicable at, at any level, but it's the creation of a – of a basketball language, um, one that you can use both on and off the court to be able to communicate with your staff, with your players. Um, I've had bosses in the past who have maybe done a lot of over explaining, or I've had coaches in the past whose maybe language is very redundant, or I've had coaches who took another language from a former boss that they had. And so that kind of brings me to a point where creating a a basketball language that's effective, efficient, but also authentic to you because it has to come naturally and it has to be able to flow, but it, it allows you, it gives you tools to effectively really, really communicate what it is you want. And so that you're sharing your perspective. And if they, if your players know the language as well, they can communicate back and share what their perspective is so then now everybody's really working on the same page. You have all the information available to you. You're communicating it effectively, and then you can use it moving forward. So it, it removes any ambiguity, right? We, we both know what, what, what each other is talking about. So I, I think that, that, that's a great point because it relieves players of a lot of stress. Like, you know, a coach will say, uh, you know, um, uh, you should have zippered cut there and yeah, maybe I don't know what, exactly what that means. And, 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 you know, so that you can, you know, if you, uh, if you have taken the time to explain all those things, then, then you, you go, it, it just reduces the, that, again, that stress of, 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 of well, I, mean, I think what you said earlier, like you don't want to keep, you don't want to have people guessing. Yeah. So, so if you define everything and you, and everybody's able to use the language, then yeah, people aren't guessing anymore. You're, you're clearly communicating and understanding um, what it is that people are either asking or instructing. Great. That's great. All right, Chris, um, I am most grateful for blank. Um, for me, it's my wife. You, you have some big news, right? Yeah, we're, uh, we're expecting our first child. Um, and so I, I, I think, uh, yeah, she, she's just incredibly supportive of, um, you know, my dreams in, in this profession. I think it's, it's a – coaching is a profession that can be really tough on spouses. Um, fortunately, she was an incredible athlete in her own right and so gets the demands of, a, of being a high-level college athlete and college coach and what comes with that. But I think she, she gets just as excited about, you know, our games and about recruits that we get, um, but also has a really good balance of, all right, Chris, it's time to – you know, it's time to put that away. And so she, she's supportive of, of the coaching and the profession, but uh, understands kind of to Brian's point that there's more to, to me and to us than that. Um, and yeah, le- learning now about what it takes to be, uh, you know, to be a mother and give yourself up for, uh, you know, for a future child has been very eye opening. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what I'm most grateful for right now. So she's, she's giving you, uh, like Brian talked about, balance and perspective. And, and yep, absolutely. Do you think you'll be a different coach as a dad? Um, I don't know yet. I, I think so, to some degree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we talked about um, how 
your players, you know, are going to see you differently rather than the young assistant coach, now a head coach, but, you know, maybe being a dad is going to, is going to enable them to see you in a, in a really totally different light. Yeah. And, and I'm, ex I'm excited for them to see me go through that journey and for me to just talk them through that, you know, cause you know, hopefully they're, you know, five, 10 years away from that process in their own right. And so I think just having a little bit of exposure to that and just using all those different scenarios that come up and how they can maybe relate to a team or, um, yeah, it'll just be a good little, uh, avenue for, for me to dive into and for them to get to know me more as a person as well. Great. Great. Kev, I am most grateful for, I am most grateful for the unconditional support that I get from my family and uh, the people that are close to me, especially my girlfriend, Ellie, um, just in whatever I do, I know that those that are close to me support me and the, the love and um, constant communication that I get from those people, my family and those that are close is, is what I'm most grateful for. What, what's, what's the best thing about it? Why, why is it so important to you? It's, it's important because through success or failure, there's those people that are around me that are a constant. And knowing that, knowing that I have that support and that no matter what, they're there for me, like it, it just makes everything, whether I do succeed or I do fail, it makes everything okay. It, it allows me to see that there is a lot more out there um, that I'm part of something bigger um, in the world. Wow, very cool. Brian? Yeah, I was trying to think of something other than family as these guys went, <laughs> um, but I will. Go with your heart, buddy, go with your go heart. Go with my heart. Uh, I would say family, um, for sure. Um, I spoke about my wife earlier, but um, like in our household, that family, because kind of what Chris was saying, like, she gives me balance perspective, um, but is also really supportive. Um, and, and she doesn't, again, not a basketball savant by any means, but really supportive in like how I can, I can help the, the players um, with schoolwork or with their girlfriend or just, just that type of stuff, um, which gives me a good balance. And then this family um, to have, to have brothers that, um, you grew up alongside with and have really ended in similar spots via different journeys um, is an awesome, awesome thing to be able to connect with um, on a professional level as well. Um, that's just a cool layer. And then you um, being in that same boat and um, how you're always an ear um, and typically have good advice, uh, good relevant professional advice is, is another um, bonus. Um, so yeah, family. Please, and please do not forget your biggest fan. My mother, of course. <laughs> she's the, uh, she's yeah. the glue, right? To be, to be known and loved is, is probably the greatest thing. Um, and she, she knows us with our, our strengths and our flaws and, uh, loves us relentlessly. So, um, I don't think any of us could probably do it without her. Well, Kevin, Kevin brought up the key word with mom. It's, it's unconditional, right? It's, yeah. uh, she is a fountain of love for, for us all and, and, and supports us in everything that we try. And, you know, th think about my life. Think about, think about what, what I've asked her to do yeah. for the, the 35 years of marriage. And, and, um, and her answer to every, every time I asked her, she's like, okay, let's do it. You know, let's, let's, let's move from New Jersey. to Ohio. Okay, let's go. Uh, let's move from Ohio to Missouri. Okay. You know, it's, it's just been, uh, it's, it's just been incredible. And she's uh, sacrificed a lot for, for us all. So. so um, 35th anniversary next week. What time? 35th wedding anniversary. 35th. That's right. That's right. And, and, and we never had a fight. <laughs> so uh, do you guys have any questions of me? Anything that you'd like to ask me? What advice would you give to a younger you? You know, that's a great question, Brian. And, and um, I, was, um, I was talking to a coach the other day and he gave me a surprising answer and I think I'm gonna steal his answer. And his response was, and when I asked him that, he said, absolutely nothing. 
that he, he felt like he needed to experience the failure, the mistakes, the successes, the joys. He needed to, he needed to experience that all in his life to be where he is today. And if he, if he, if, if, if any of that was stolen from him, then he, then, then he probably wouldn't be the person that he is today. So I think that, um, that, uh, you know, I, I like that response because I like where I am today. And, and, you know, I love my relationship with my, with my family and my sons and my wife. And, and, and I love, I really enjoy my job. And, um, so I think my, 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 I, I'm going to, you know, nothing. I, I, I would, uh, I would let myself go through all of those things so that, that I, I wound up exactly where I am today. How about a, how about a good book? Um, you know, uh, getting back to your idea of uh, mindfulness, a, a book that I just read is called uh, 10% Happier by a guy named um, Dan Harris. Mm -hmm. And it's about his journey into mindfulness. And he was a, he's a, an ABC news. Um, he was an anchor on the, on, on their big network news show. And, and, and actually, if you Google him, had a panic attack on national television. And so that led him into this journey into mindfulness. And, and, you know, and I've always kind of dabbled with mindfulness and, and, and wanted to learn more, but after that, I was so inspired by his story and his book that I think, um, you know, it, from the start of this, um, of the, the pandemic, um, I've, I've now meditated for 85 straight days. So it's, you know, I, I, and I think I have him to thank for that. So, all right, guys, I can't, uh, I can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we have, uh, I'm glad we have this in, uh, you know, to put in the, the time capsule. Yeah. So yeah. In one, not in one place, but in virtually one place to be able to sh talk about our, our ideas. And it'd be interesting to revisit this in a few years as your, as your careers evolve, as you, yeah. you, know, you, you stay in coaching, move out of coaching and, and just to, to kind of revisit some of our answers to see, uh, how how our how we've um, how we've grown and, and changed and and, uh, and progressed and you know Chris to see what what fatherhood does to you and and Kev well, you know hope, hope if, if you you know what a head coaching job does to you and and Brian you know if you you veer off into um, into more working directly with athletes with that you know that, that would be real in a real interesting journey as well so we'll uh, we'll see where it all goes. But uh, well, thank thanks, guys. I love you all. And uh, hope to see you in person soon. You sign off all your interviews like that? <laughs> I do. I tell all my people, all my, all my, yeah, well, I love you too. I love them. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys.